Hey everyone, welcome to our AP Biology Protein Synthesis Review. This video is meant for AP Biology students who are reviewing for maybe a midterm, or for any of my biology students who might be working on the challenge focus area uh, for biology class. Let's get started. Remember this video is a review, it's meant as a quick overview, so please use our other resources we've provided in class in order to go deeper into the content mentioned in this video. Let's start with DNA and RNA. Now, DNA is part of our universal genetic code. When we talk about DNA, we talk about the structure of DNA as a nucleic acid, which is made of nucleotides, which you can kind of down, see down here. Chromatin, or the DNA that is in the nucleus in a eukaryotic organism, is typically wrapped around proteins called histones, which then group into something called a nucleosome. So we have lots of DNA-based pairs wrapped around a uh, core of histone proteins. And then these nucleosomes themselves are organized into different structures so that we can finally package it into chromosomes if necessary, or um, into typically heterochromatin in different phases of the cell cycle. When we have parts of the DNA exposed, uh, through different processes, we can have this DNA be active or transcribed and translated into functional proteins. We have processes like methylation and phosphorylation of these histone tails um, to continuously modify the chromatin uh, constantly so that the DNA can be accessible. So DNA and RNA are carriers of genetic information in cells. They are part of our universal genetic code. And in most cases, information is passed from parent to offspring via DNA. In some cases, this will be through RNA molecules. Non-eukaryotic eukaryotic organisms have circular chromosomes, as we see here, while eukaryotic organisms have multiple linear chromosomes, although we know there's exceptions to this rule. So typically, our prokaryotic organisms are going to have a single origin of replication, whereas our eukaryotic chromosomes might have many. And remember, a gene is a sequence that is expressed to form a functional product, either RNA or a polypeptide, which can then become a protein depending on the situation. Now, plasmids are an important part of things that we'll talk about in biotechnology, but remember, prokaryotes, viruses, and eukaryotic organisms can contain plasmids, and these are small, extra-chromosomal, double-stranded, circular DNA molecules, um, and so we will talk about these a lot when we get to um, some of our biotechnology um, ideas, such as transformation. So, the proof that DNA is the carrier of genetic information took place over lots of different experiments with many scientists and collaborations, um, such as the Hersey Chase experiments, Griffith experiments, so you can go over these um, in a different video. I'm going to not go through them today because we don't want this review to be too long, but please remember to review them and check them out. All right, so let's start to talk about DNA replication. DNA needs to replicate in order for a cell to divide, or else we wouldn't end up with the same genetic information passed from a parent cell to daughter cell. And replication is a semi-conservative process, so that means one strand serves as the template for a new complementary strand. Replication is going to require DNA polymerase and then some other cellular enzymes, which we'll talk about in a second, and it's going to occur at um, two parts of our DNA molecule. So, um, We'll talk about the direction of replication in a moment. When the DNA is opened up with our helicase enzyme, what we're going to have is one leading strand, which will be synthesized in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction continuously, and then a lagging strand, which will be synthesized discontinuously, still built in 5' prime to 3' prime, but in small little fragments, which we call Okazaki fragments. So this is our lagging strand, this is our leading strand, and again, RNA polymerase is always going to add new nucleotides in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, um, but these will be synthesized a little bit differently depending on the side they're on. So remember the nucleotide sequence, so whatever is on this template strand is going to determine which nucleotides are going to be added to the newly synthesized strand. So if there was an A here on the DNA, there would be a complementary T. If there was a G, we would add a complementary C, and so on and so on. Remember, polymerase here is our DNA polymerase, and we're going to only add new nucleotides to the free 3' prime end. So a new DNA strand elongates only in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So remember, always goes in the 5' prime to 3'. Prime. Same thing here, 5 to 3, and then jumps back 5 to 3. Some of our important enzymes that we're going to talk about are helicase, polymerase, ligase, and 
to poismeres, which is a mouthful. This one here, we don't mention a ton in class, but it's going to help. Um, it's an enzyme that helps uh, stabilize the DNA um, during the unwinding, so we don't have any super coiling or tight twisting and coiling of our DNA. Um, so it's a little bit ahead of where we're actually being unwound. Helicase, I don't have depicted here, but this is going to be our unzipping or our uh, molecular scissors that'll actually unzip our DNA. Polymerase is going to add to our uh, template strand by building the new strand, so adding the new um, nucleotide sequences on or as a complement to the template strand. And then ligase is going to covalently connect sections of DNA um, that are being synthesized in fragments. So our DNA ligase is important here, especially when we get to our lagging strand or our Okazaki fragments. Now remember that replication is a semi-conservative process, so one strand serves as a template for the new complementary strand. Replication requires DNA polymerase and a lot of other enzymes like we talk about, um, and each strand is anti-parallel, which means the 5 to 3 prime direction of one strand runs counter to the other 5 to 3 prime direction of the other strand. So if we have a 5 prime on this end, we would have a 3 prime on this end. And remember those primes actually refer to the carbons in the sugar in that nucleotide. So so if you need to zoom in and take a look close up of a nucleotide to help you understand this, that might be helpful. All right, so let's talk a little bit about differences between RNA and DNA before we get into protein synthesis. RNA and DNA are both uh, nucleic acids, and they're going to have several similarities. They both have a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogenous base to form a nucleotide, which is our monomer of this particular uh, larger organic compound or organic molecule. And th those three units are nitrogenous base, our sugar, and our phosphate are connected by covalent bonds um, that are going to create this linear molecule. In DNA, we're going to have those nitrogenous bases connected by hydrogen bonds in the center, but RNA, of course, is single-stranded, so we will not have the hydrogen bonds connecting unless we are building an mRNA molecule or we are connecting with an anticodon in our particular part of protein synthesis or in another situation where the RNA would need to bind. More structural differences, DNA is going to contain deoxyribose sugar instead of ribose sugar, hence the name deoxyribonucleic acid versus ribonucleic acid. RNA will have a uracil base instead of a thymine base. And DNA, again, usually double-stranded, RNA usually single-stranded. And then in the DNA strands, these are going to run anti-parallel um, to each other. RNA is just single-stranded. Both of these are going to have specific base pairing rules, so A will always pair with Ts, Gs will always pair with Cs, unless we're adding our RNA, which will um, you will replace the T in that situation, so A would pair with a U. G and A, our purines, are going to have our double ring structure, as you can see here, and pyridamines, which are C, T's and U's will have a single ring structure. And these are just our nitrogenous bases and how they're structured a little bit differently. All right, so let's get into protein synthesis, which is our universal genetic code. Remember, our central dogma of molecular biology is that we go from a molecule of DNA, which contains genes, to a single-stranded mRNA, to then a fully folded functional polypeptide that is made of amino acids. This step here from going to DNA to mRNA is called transcription, and then from going mRNA to an actual protein is called translation. Remember, DNA to RNA, we're just transcribing it from one nucleic acid to the other. RNA to a protein, we're translating it from one molecular language to a different molecular language. RNA polymerase is going to read the DNA molecule and going to synthesize complementary mRNA molecules um, that are going to later determine the order of amino acids in the polypeptide. Eukaryotic organisms are going to have several transcription factors which will help with this regulation. In eukaryotic organisms as well, the mRNA transcript is going to later undergo a series of enzyme-regulated modifications. An exon is an expressed region, an intron um, is an intervening region, and so these introns will be removed um, during this post-transcriptional modification before the mRNA leaves. We can also have the addition of something like a poly A tail or a 5' prime cap, and these are going to help with uh, the stabilization of the mRNA before it leaves, so it doesn't get degraded. Um, when it before it actually gets translated. We can also have what's called alternative splicing, so we can have different exons removed or included depending on which version of the DNA we need for the mRNA. So this is going to allow us to have several different types of proteins from one DNA transcript. Now we're going to get to translation. 
Remember that translation occurs in the cytoplasm on the ribosome. Now in prokaryotic organisms, transcription is coupled to the translation. So that means translation can, be be can begin while transcription is still in progress. In eukaryotic organisms, this is going to happen at an entirely different location. So remember, transcription occurs in the nucleus for eukaryotic organisms, and then in the cytoplasm on the ribosome for these eukaryotes. Prokaryotic organisms do not have a membrane-bound nucleus, so we will not see this occurring. Translation involves energy, and there's a lot of steps, including initiation, elongation, and termination. The tRNA, which you can kind of see here, the animation slowed down a little bit, we'll try to bring it back up, brings the correct amino acid to the correct place on the, on the mRNA. And remember, there's no DNA involved in this step. The amino acid is then transferred to the growing polypeptide chain, and this process continues along the mRNA until a stop codon is reached. The process is going to terminate by the release of our newly synthesized polypeptide or protein. And then, of course, the phenotype of an organism is going to be determined through the activities of the protein. So this is why we say DNA is the instructions for who we are. The DNA is later going to be changed into functional proteins that will cause the cell to behave or have structural differences, uh, depending on whatever the genetic information is. In thinking about protein synthesis, we talk a lot about mutations and changes in the DNA, and think about what types of mutations might be catastrophic for the effect of the, of the protein. Since codons are units of three, if we just had a single point mutation, we might have an entire frame shift, meaning the reading frame would be shifted and every single codon following the mutation would be then affected, which could result in a premature stop codon, like a nonsense mutation, or it could result in entirely non-functional protein. So point mutations can have devastating effects on a particular protein, or they could simply have no effect at all and be silent. So this will just depend on what the actual change is going to do to the protein. All right, that's our quick version of protein synthesis. Hopefully this was helpful for your review. Thanks, guys.